Welcome. Uh, it's so lovely to see you all. Um, after what's been a, more than a couple of years, actually, th this is an event that we used to do every year. And uh, I will share with you, it's the event I think that this team likes the most because it involves nearly the whole team in writing things or helping design the publication. And then we all get to come and do this event and we, we get to meet you. And also, you'll see we have loads of speakers. So that's the good news. It's not just me all night. We're going to have a succession of people uh, in quite a quick fire way coming on and talking about some of the things that's in the handbook, which hopefully you've all got. I don't know if it was on the chair or outside, but hopefully you have that. Uh, we're not going to talk about all of them. <clears throat> uh, we're just going to cover a selection of them. But anyway, just to say, it's really lovely to have you here. Uh, we missed you, even the ones uh, I haven't seen before. We missed you as well. We missed everybody. Uh, it's just fantastic to be doing this. Now, some of you will know that as a firm, technology is a huge part of our business. So technology in the widest sense, if we include sort of tech company, IT type tech, computer -y technology, but also if we bring in life sciences, in all that's probably about 70-ish percent of, this, of the revenue, frankly, for the, for the firm. It's huge for us. Now, what that means is, as a data protection team, we're incredibly lucky because a lot of the most challenging issues that you get with data come from applying technology and processing it in a particularly clever new way or something like that. So we have some really interesting things that cross our desks. Now, in the past, what we've done with this publication is we've called it the data protection top 10. And we just, as a bit of fun, a bit like those sort of Channel 5 programs you get, where it's the top 50 embarrassing internet moments, that kind of thing. We would do the top 10 data protection issues. Um, and we just write, the, write about them and give them out and pretend that the order was very scientifically put together. This year, what we thought we would do is lean into this technology focus a little bit more and take a look at how GDPR and technology work together. Um, and it's interesting because GDPR, it's no coincidence, by the way, that it is GDPR's fourth birthday today. We don't just throw this stuff together. That was all carefully uh, planned, obviously. Um, now, GDPR was originally, it came about as, a, as the commission's response to lots of new technologies. The previous law was pre-cloud, pre-apps, pre-internet of things, certainly pre-metaverse, pre-World Wide Web, really. Uh, and they felt they needed a new law to come along and address all of these issues, uh, which is what they did. So we thought today would be, in part, an opportunity for us to have a look at this four-year-old, see how they're performing or misbehaving, perhaps. Um, so that's part of it. And then the other part of it, of course, is that in the Queen's speech, we had uh, some foreshadowing of the data reform bill. And a lot of that, when we see it, we're, we're expecting will be focused on technology. And so it's one of the government's, um, let's not get into Brexit, but it's one of the government's post-Brexit aims to produce an economy that is a bit of an econ um, a technology hub and have a, have a law that is respectful of individuals' rights while at the same time nurturing technology and helping it to grow and helping the economy grow. So it's a good time for us to look at the technology side of things. So like I said, you're going to hear from Rather a lot of us, unless things go badly wrong, you won't hear for, from anyone for more than about 10 minutes, so don't worry. Uh, but it's quite a few uh, to cover all of the materials. And you're going to hear about a few specific technologies, ad tech, the metaverse. You're also going to hear about some themes that are particularly relevant when it comes to technology. So anything to do with data transfers clearly um, hits technology head on. And then also we're going to talk a little bit about litigation, uh, and even that has uh, something of a technology theme uh, this year and that we're going to be focused to some extent on a case that's essentially an ad tech case. So that's enough from me. Uh, just to say, I think the way this format works with so many speakers speaking for a short period, amount of time, we're going to do questions at the end, if that's all okay. Uh, and there should be plenty of time. I'm even thinking we'll probably finish a bit early and then we can hit the canapes and wine um, after that. So with Without any further ado, uh, I'll introduce our, well, I'll let our first speakers introduce themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's Jamie Drucker. I'm a senior associate in the data protection team. And I'm Sakanya Majumda. I'm an associate in the commercial technology and copyright disputes team. And we've been given the slightly unenviable task of boiling down all developments in ad tech in 10 minutes. Uh, so we're not even going to attempt that. What we're going to do instead is we're going to pick out a couple of the themes from the conversation that Sakanya and I had that's, that you'll find in, in the publication. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, it's a time of change for, for the ad tech market. Uh, and, and really that change is driven by, I'd say, two main factors. So on the one hand, we're seeing a significant increase, a significant, significant uptick in regulatory pressure. So across Europe, across the UK, we're seeing investigations into ad tech organizations. The ICO, for example, has had a, a, an ad tech investigation on the go since early 2019. That is still running, albeit with a somewhat uncertain status. Uh, we're seeing regulators like the CNIL in France take some, some significant enforcement action against some of the larger players uh, in the market. Um, and we've sort of saw the culmination of that in February this year with the Belgian Data Protection Authority's decision in relation to the transparency and consent framework. And we'll leave Sakanya to talk about that in a minute or two. Um, that regulatory pressure is informed by, must be seen in the context of, some significant pressure from data activists. So individuals like Max Schrems, Johnny Ryan, issuing complaints, issuing pieces of litigation, pushing the market um, towards what, what they want, which is a, a greater compliance position. That's probably one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is a technological change. So as you'll probably be aware, um, some browsers already have deprecated the use of third-party cookies and Google Chrome is planning to do that. I think the current plan is the end of next year. That's gonna have a very significant impact on uh, how organizations share personal data for, for delivering targeted advertising. Uh, and I'm gonna come back after Sakanya and talk a bit about what that might look like. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so I'm gonna speak a bit about the IAB decision that happened earlier this year. It has been one of the biggest decisions affecting the ad tech industry in recent years. Some of you might have heard a bit about it already. If you haven't, don't worry, I'm gonna go over some of the key points and how it affects the ad tech market. So the decision was passed by the Belgian Data Protection Authority and they were tasked with investigating a series of complaints about IAB Europe's transparency and consent framework, the TCF. So the TCF is essentially a set of policies it's a technical protocol which the ad tech industry uses to verify that they're all clean and GDPR compliant. The best way to understand the TCF is from the user's perspective. And from the user's perspective, the entry point to the TCF is something called a consent management platform. Now, most people here have probably seen and used a consent management platform before. You know when you go on a website or open a new app and you get that banner or that pop-up that comes up where you can select which ad tech vendors you consent to your data to be processed by or you consent which purposes that you consent to? That's a consent management platform. So all of your preferences, all of your consents from that platform are stored on something called a consent string. And in the world of ad tech, a publisher, an ad tech vendor, a brand, they will have access to that string and they will use it to verify that they have all the right consents to show you targeted advertising. Now, when I say targeted advertising here, I mean real-time bidding. So for those less familiar with this, real-time bidding is essentially an online auction of ad space and it happens almost instantaneously and it allows advertisers to put out lots and lots of adverts very, very quickly to a very targeted group of audience. So most of these players who provide real-time bidding actually rely on the consent strings from the TCF, which is why it was quite a big deal when the Belgian Data Protection Authority decided that this golden standard that everyone was using and this industry best practice wasn't actually GDPR compliant. So that decision happened earlier this year and it's quite long and I'm not gonna go into lots and lots of detail about it because I only have 10 minutes and I don't want you to boo me off. So I'm gonna focus just on two main points. The first one is the decision emphasized that 
if you're going to do targeted advertising in real-time bidding, you need user consent. So legitimate interests is no longer a viable option. And really, the decision reiterated what regulators have already been saying, and this is something that was generally un understood in the market already. And now we just have proper confirmation of it. So no more legitimate interest. It has to be consent. The second part of the decision that I'm going to talk about is the consent and the decision that the consents that were used and relied upon from the consent strings, they weren't GDPR compliant either. And there's a whole host of analysis in the judgment, but there are three main reasons why the consents were flawed. The first one is because the consents were just not precise enough. They weren't um, specific and they were just too generic. So at the end of the day, the user didn't really know what they were consenting to. And the second reason they were flawed was because there were just too many ad tech vendors that possibly could receive the personal data. And there was no feasible way for the users to really understand under which consent management platform they were giving their consent to which ad tech vendors. This is essentially a scale issue. There were just too many vendors. And finally, the consents were flawed because if a user decided to withdraw their consent, even though they could elect to do this, putting that into practice was actually quite difficult because once the consent had gone, the user might say, yes, OK, I'm going to withdraw it. But that um, communication back to all of the participants was practically impossible to do. And obviously, that's quite a big problem under GDPR. So where are we now? Um, IB Europe have understandably appealed the decision. And we're still waiting for an outcome of that appeal. Essentially, it's left the industry in a bit of uncertainty over the last few months because there isn't really an alternative to the TCF to do real-time bidding. However, it's not all bad news because IAB Europe have submitted an action plan to the Belgian DPA. And the action plan basically sets out a few proposals and suggestions of bringing the TCF more aligned with how the Belgian DPA interpreted the GDPR. Essentially, it's a proposal to make some changes. And our current understanding today is there has been an agreement reached between the Belgian DPA and IAB Europe on this action plan. Now, the details of that plan we don't have yet, and nothing has been officially formalized, but it doesn't look quite as bleak as it originally did, which is good. Um, thank you. I'm going to hand back over to Jamie now, who's going to talk a bit about the future of the industry in the context of what I've just said. Thanks, Kenya. So I think just taking a step back and thinking about that IAB decision, I think the initial reaction was back in February when it came out, just how difficult it is to get a, a GDPR compliant consent in the context of an incredibly complex ecosystem where data is being shared with, with multiple parties. I think if IAB have come to an agreement with, with the Belgians, that's really positive news. Um, the devil will be in the detail in terms of what, what that looks like and what it looks like from an implementation perspective for the participants. But I think when we've been thinking about consent and when we've been working on consent wording over the last two, three years, we've really been thinking about it from the perspective of cookies. So working on cookie pop-ups, cookie banners, making sure it works, making sure you've got the appropriate consent to meet the e-privacy requirement to have a prior opt-in consent for the use of cookies. So once third-party cookies are gone, where does that leave us? Does this all just fall away, or does consent validity still remain as a very significant challenge for the market? Um, I think it's safe to say there's a bit of a scramble going on in, in, in the market to try and find solutions that enable advertisers to continue to reach the audiences that they need to, to enable publishers to, enable, to, to properly monetize their content. Uh, and monetize their ad inventory, uh, but at the same time try and bake in some of these privacy protections that regulators have been talking about. Um, I think it, we're, at, we're at quite an early stage. There's a number of solutions out there to replace third-party cookies. Some of them are being, being tested, some of them we're going to be hearing about in the months and years to come. Um, and regulators are not being silent on this. So you might have seen the ICO put out a report at the end of last year, basically going through all of the the proposed third-party cookie replacements and commenting on them and saying the expectation is the status quo is just not going to work anymore. So something that is a like-for-like -like replacement of a third-party cookie that has all the same issues is going to remain a problem. 
Um, in terms of the range of solutions out there, I know we're possibly running out of time and we couldn't do them justice in a couple of minutes, but looking at the range, you've got on the one hand what I would call an identifier-based solution. So that's some form of exchange of personal data with a user, say an email address, maybe that, that, that gets hashed and gets turned into another form of identifier that can get disseminated through the ecosystem and shared with various third parties. Completely on the other end of the scale, you'll, you'll have organizations moving away from personalized advertising and trying to do something a little bit more clever with their contextual advertising, so possibly using data-driven or AI-driven contextual advertising. Google is obviously very heavily into this. Um, you would have heard about the privacy sandbox. So that's Google's set of proposals to replace third-party cookies and enable uh, advertisers and publishers to continue to, to reach the right audiences. Uh, and those proposals, try, again, are trying to bake in those privacy protections. So for example, the, the Google Topics proposal, uh, the way that works is it looks at a user's browsing history over a one week or a two week period and effectively assigns that user one or two broad topics or trends. And it's that broad topic or trend that gets shared with the advertisers to enable them to make a somewhat informed bid. Now there's a whole range of other solutions out there. Just, just, just touching on the ones I've talked about, some of them are gonna require consent. So anything that's sort of identifier-based, user-level-based, consent is still going to be an issue. And it sounds like probably where we're heading, TCF version 3, or wh whatever it looks like, is going to have to underpin those solutions. Some of the solutions are a bit more based on sharing aggregated or anonymized data or grouping um, individuals into more anonymous cohorts. Um, for those, consent either falls away or perhaps just becomes simpler. So organizations are still going to be looking to use their first party data and may still need to consent that, but they're not going to be seeking consent to share that data with hundreds of participants. So possibly there's some simplification there. I suppose the, the, the takeaway point is diversification is quite likely. You're not going to see a publisher just implement one proposal. They're going to be doing a range of things. And so consent wording, consent pop-ups, going to have to be quite agile going to have to capture a range of solutions, a range of different types of data being collected, and going to have to be thought through quite carefully. Um, there's an awful lot going on, so, so watch this space. Thanks. I'm Mac Macmillan. I'm a counsel in the data team. So, anonymization. I think probably, hope everyone in this room, knows that when we talk about data protection law, we're talking about processing data relating to identified or identifiable individuals. If you can't tell who people are, if the data's anonymous, it's outside the rules. You don't need to worry. Good news. But what do we mean when we say the data's anonymized? And We've always wrestled with this question. Non-specialists think it's straightforward. You take out someone's name, you don't know who they are, the data is anonymous. And of course, it's never been that simple. We've always had to think about context. You could have two pieces of information which don't identify one person in most contexts, like their place of work and their hair color. And in certain rare circumstances, it will identify the person. So we've always had to think about context. And I've dealt with countless US vendors whose website policies assure me that they don't collect any personal data at all. And then I ask them if they collect IP addresses. And they say, well, of course we do. And then we have another little conversation about what we mean by personal data. So it's always been an issue for us. But why are we talking about it today? when we're talking about hot trends in technology? Well, one very pedestrian reason is that we're getting new guidance. The ICO is currently drip feeding a consultation chapter by chapter of its anonymization code of practice. And if you do work in this area or it touches on your work at all, I would encourage you to go to the website and look at it and feed back your, your responses to it. The EDPB also has updating its anonymization guidelines on its work plan for this year. 
So that's the first reason. But a much more important reason is that trends in technology and research are making this quite a big issue in practice. We see lots of projects which need vast amounts of data relating to real people, but they have no interest in knowing who those real people are. For example, if you've got an AI project, machine learning, you need a huge training data set, but depending on what you're trying to learn, you don't care about their real-world identities. Uh, there are also lots of medical research projects wanting, for example, to use the vast resource represented by NHS patient records. And in both those circumstances, you've got such a vast data set, it's really difficult to comply with data protection rules. So the obvious next step is to say, let's anonymize the data. So then you're saying, well, I need to take account of all the means which are reasonably likely to be used either by the controller or by another person, to identify the individual directly or indirectly. The test hasn't changed, but the impact of technology means the impact of the test has changed. Processing to re-identify someone, which 10 years ago might have required an incredibly rare supercomputer, is now an everyday possibility for lots of organizations. So re-identification, which wasn't possible 10 years ago, is possible now. And that makes your project much harder because it's becoming much more difficult to anonymize data. And if, if this is a subject you haven't looked at and you are interested in it, there's a really good explanation and illustration of this in the report from the Goldacre Review, which was published last month. So that's the review into how we can use NHS data more effectively while still protecting privacy. And there's a really good example there of, of why rich data sets are such a privacy risk, even when you've sought to anonymize them. So where do we go with this? Well, the current trend is for a debate about how far you can take environmental controls into account. So if you're looking at means which are reasonably likely to be used, can you say, well, I'm going to put this data into a closed environment which is only accessible by responsible researchers that have all contractually promised that they're not going to try and re-identify people and they're not going to combine it with other data sets and they're not going to publish the data. So really, there aren't any means reasonably likely to be used which could lead to identification. Now, looking at the ICO guidance, it does seem to be receptive to this approach. It talks about looking at the identifiability spectrum and your re-identification risk. Um, and that, on the one hand, seems quite sensible to focus on real-world risks rather than getting hung up on academic debates. Um, and it does seem to be supporting the way forward that a, a lot of research institutions are looking at creating trusted research environments, which is one of the, the buzzwords you hear a lot in this area. But I think it does leave us with a slightly fuzzy position in certain areas and, and questions to ponder. And that's not a criticism of the ICO. I'm just saying this is a really difficult area. Anonymization is difficult. So we're always going to have some uncertainty, but I thought I'd share with you just three examples for you to think about. So one thing is that the draft guidance talks a lot about effective anonymization, particularly in the context of where data is being released. So in the context of that closed research environment, you can say in that environment, the data is effectively anonymized, even though if I released it into the wild, there'd be a re-identification risk. But what do we mean by effective anonymization? Does that mean it's not properly anonymized? And if it's not properly anonymized, do the rules apply? There's a rather odd statement, well, I think it's rather odd, in the, in the section on governance in the ICO code that says you should only use anonymous information in ways individuals would reasonably expect. Well, reasonable expectation is a data protection concept. 
And the whole reason I've gone to all this effort to anonymize my data is so I don't have to worry about the data protection rules. So when do I have to worry about the rules? When do they stop applying? So that's one fuzzy area. Another interesting area is what if I decided the data was effectively anonymized in my closed environment and I knew there was a re-identification risk in the wild and I have a data breach? Is that a personal data breach? Do I need to report it? Well, the ICO says, if a security incident leads to re-identification of an individual from data you treated as anonymous data prior to the incident, we would not consider this as a personal data breach at the time. This is providing you can demonstrate your decision making to justify that the data was effectively anonymized. So, I know that my data has escaped into the wild and there's a re-identification risk, but I don't need to warn anybody because it's not personal data? Just a question. And then finally, this is a, a conundrum that one of my colleagues had to deal with. So imagine this scenario where you've got party A and party B, and party A has pseudonymized the data, so it's still personal data, but they've decided if they give it to party B, it is effectively anonymized. So it seems that that's okay. We can give the data to party B. What if party B is in the United States? I'm releasing personal data, but they're not receiving personal data. So do I need standard contractual clauses? Does it stop being personal data before leaving the UK or somewhere under the Atlantic? I'll just leave you with that one to ponder. Thank you. Um, so I think Chris and I have got the dubious honor of doing the geekiest presentation tonight. Um, so we're going to talk about the metaverse, a little bit about the development, um, about the regulation, and then we're also going to talk about NFTs in the metaverse. Introduce oh, I'm Daniel. I'm an associate in, um, in the Calm IPT team in um, Bristow's, and this is Christopher, uh, senior counsel in our team. So the metaverse and the development of the concept, it was first coined, the phrase metaverse, in the 1992 novel Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. And his idea was a virtual reality successor to the internet, where you put on a headset and you play games, but you also socialize, you can shop, you can even go to the doctor in the metaverse. And I think at this stage, that's a good definition to hold in your head when you're thinking about this um, concept. So we've already seen semi-immersive worlds already in gaming. So if you think about the early 2000s, if anyone you were gaming back then, there was Second Life. Um, in the mid-2000s, in my gaming heyday, we had World of Warcraft. Um, I imagine not many of you are surprised that I played a lot of World of Warcraft. Um, and more recently, we've got Roblox and Fortnite, both games that started as quite linear games, but have uh, moved to embrace more metaverse-like concepts recently. So recently, um, Fortnite had a massive concert where people weren't playing a game, they were just socializing in, an immersive, in a semi-immersive environment. And so recently, software and hardware, like uh, the Oculus, which I'll uh, just hold up my Oculus now, um, has developed to a point where we can create more sophisticated virtual environments, um, which can become more immersive. And this has led to people spotting potential to create that metaverse that Neil Stevenson imagined, where you can not just play games, but you can also um, receive healthcare, shop, and socialize. And this is, a, in, in terms of examples of this high profile investment, you have probably the, the best example is Facebook that changed its name to Meta to really emphasize its commitment to the metaverse. You've also got Microsoft, which is nearly about to release its Mesh product, which is a VR version of Teams. I'm sure we're all looking forward to doing VR meetings soon, like the one in the picture. And it's not just companies. So, so the South Korean government earlier this year said it was investing over $100 million in creating a metaverse ecosystem so um, citizens could receive public services in the metaverse. So we have a fast developing successor to the internet that's intended to be used for a wide range of human activity, 
Will this be easy to regulate, Christopher? Oh, right. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, big question. That. I've got two minutes, four minutes. Okay. Right. Thanks very much, Dan. So um, I have a bit of a sense of uh, deja vu uh, all over again about this. And I want to just read you a quote from the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace in case you uh, weren't around or haven't read it since. So this is from February uh, 1996. It was issued in Davos. And um, I'll just read you a short, give you a short flavor of it. So, governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. They're based on matter, and there is no matter here. Now, who said that? Or who wrote that, I should say? Oh, nobody's going to jump to it. Okay. A chap called uh, the late John Perry Barlow, who was, was known for a number of things. He was a lyricist for the Grateful Dead uh, rock band. Uh, he was a cattle rancher. He was a poet. But he was also a cyber libertarian and an ambassador for EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And it was in that capacity that he released this Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. Now, I will always regret not having sent him um, a paper I wrote with a colleague the previous year called Cyberspace and the No Regulation Fallacy, in which we argued uh, an opposite kind of paradigm might be appropriate. Actually, never in the course of human history have so many laws and regulations and restrictions applied to activities as we're going to apply to this new World Wide Web, which was just starting up, really, to go big time in the mid to late 90s. So I have a bit of a sense of deja vu now we're talking about the metaverse. I think uh, people have uh, figured out since then that actually a lot of laws have a long arm reach, and that includes, of course, our favorite law here tonight, the GDPR, or, depending on your taste, the UK GDPR. And I don't think there's any doubt now, actually, that these laws can reach into the metaverse, indeed, to infinity and beyond, and that's because in two directions, these laws have extremely long arm reach. So the establishment rule, many of you will be very familiar with this, means that processing of personal data in the context of an establishment of an EU organization is processed anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, indeed, arguably, anywhere in other worlds like metaverses. And the same uh, provisions in the UK GDPR. And the other way that we have the long arm reach is uh, in terms of offering goods or services to people in the EU or the UK, if you're outside in a so-called third country, or monitoring the behavior of people in the EU or the UK if you're outside those places. So I think that's uh, actually not going to take much more discussion. Now, let's just take it as read for now that these laws, include data protection laws, most likely do apply to actors who are active in metaverses. But what does that mean in practice, specifically in terms of uh, data protection compliance? Well, a lot of things, actually, and I'm just going to pick on a couple. One of them is how you manage relationships between the actors in the metaverse, or metaverses, because I think there are going to be lots of them. And some of you will be familiar, because we've discussed it at previous events, but the uh, decisions of the Court of Justice in recent years on joint controllers and joint controllership mean that there are many more joint controllers, many more controllers indeed, than we thought possible uh, a few years ago. And indeed, one estimate for, uh, for Facebook, in terms of people who use Facebook pages, um, is that there could be as many as 100 million people who are joint controllers with Facebook. Now, some of them are big companies, some of them are governments, big organizations, lots of them are very small traders, a lot of them are individuals, and they have now got to enter into a contract, which is the addendum that Facebook put out very promptly, actually, after one of these court of justice decisions, in which they agree with Facebook certain things to do with how they will process personal data jointly. Now, when you think about the metaverse and all the potential actors, not just the technology providers, but all the people who provide services to people in the metaverse, and potentially a lot of the individuals even in the metaverse, if they find a way of monetizing their activities in a metaverse, then they may well become controllers and potentially joint controllers with one or more 
other controllers. So that, I think, is going to be uh, quite complicated. In terms of the, the kind of data we're collecting, and uh, it's fascinating to hear um, what Max said about anonymization, because this is going to be one of the most interesting areas, I think, in the metaverse. So on the one hand, there's going to be vast scope for tracking people and profiling their behavior. But what I want to, to just leave you with, uh, from my uh, thoughts on this, is what does it mean in terms of the interface between a metaverse and out stuff outside in what used to be called real life, IRL. Now, um, I guess this is a trigger warning for vegetarians and vegans, but please bear with me. I don't mean to offend you. I mean, I think this is about what happens to autonomy in meat space compared to cyber space. And uh, as we found with things like blockchain, where initially there were lots of cyber libertarians saying, fantastic, this is all going to be anonymous, you can't track us, you don't know what we're doing with our money. It's not that simple, because you have to have off-chain assets that connect with on-chain records. And the same is going to be true in metaverses. Uh, so uh, it is quite possible that you think you will be completely anonymous. You can create your persona, your avatar, be whoever you want. But it may be possible to track you because you'll want to do things that connect with people and things on the outside, in the outside world, including money. Um, so on the one hand, you might say, well, we're we going to lose all our ability to be autonomous and to present ourselves differently in different contexts. And I actually think we don't know yet. Because another way of looking at this, the, the less dystopian way perhaps, is that maybe we would be able to um, organize our lives, if we can remember how to do it, and that's one of the challenges here, so that we still have different personas in different places, including different virtual places. Uh, indeed, why not, you know, th there are simple privacy techniques uh, uh, privacy by obfuscation is what the academics call it, where you, you just pretend to be a different age or a different gender or a different place or a different whatever in different contexts online. But just imagine if you have different personas and they are fully fledged out in avatars who interact with other avatars in metaverses. Then never mind disposable e email addresses. Maybe in future we'll have disposable you and you can be a different person in each metaverse. So I, I leave that with you. We don't actually know which way that's going to go. In terms of the dystopian versus utopian argument, one final comment. Um, I do think a lot of things could go really badly wrong in metaverses, and there is a lot of potential for harm, actually, especially of vulnerable individuals. On the other hand, uh, the first time I, I got to put on a HoloLens and see what you could do with telemedicine and telesurgery, I realized the potential for good is also enormous. So again, I think the jury is out on that one. Back to you, Dan. Cool. Thanks very much, Christopher. So NFTs in the metaverse, so we're doing two for one on new technologies here. So NFTs and the metaverse are often spoken about together. This is partly because they're both fashionable tech topics at the moment. But I think more concretely, the metaverse provides a good use case for NFTs. So when people roll their eyes at NFTs and say they're worthless, perhaps the metaverse will give them some more value. Um, so if we just take a high level definition of NFTs, they are a way of recording digital ownership on a blockchain. The non-fungible aspect of the definition is that they're unique and they can't be traded one for one for another token like a cryptocurrency. So anything can be made into an NFT, so a physical asset, but more importantly, a digital asset. And why would you make a digital asset into an NFT? Well, the answer is probably in, t in making some money out of it, right? So what you want to do is create a feel of authenticity, so feel that something is better because it's an NFT, because it's the real deal. And also, through that, you create artificial scarcity. And it's not a surprise that the luxury and art industries are the, the first two industries to really get NFTs. So if you think about NFTs as a way of giving digital assets value, then the metaverse where digital assets are going to be very important because you want your avatar to look cool, have cool trainers, you want them to have somewhere to live, and you might even want them to have some rights, and the rights might be something you have to buy via an NFT. So this is something that um, could be a good use case for NFT, and that's one of the reasons why NFTs is often spoken about in the context of the metaverse. Another perhaps more complicated reason is that some people are of the view that NFTs can assist in the interoperability of the metaverse. So as Christopher mentioned, we're probably not going to end up with one metaverse. We're going to end up with metaverses. And you want to be able to move between the metaverses 
wearing your expensive Nike trainers. And how are we going to achieve that when you've got different companies with different tax tracks trying to all make different proprietary IP speak together? And so the suggestion amongst people who are a big fan of crypto and NFTs is that you could use the central truth ledger of the NFT, so the proof of ownership, as a sort of digital backpack. So when you move between metaverses, you have a list of what you own, and that each metaverse will then render what your avatar owns to the extent it's relevant in the new metaverse. So this is really important. So um, if we don't think that NFTs are the whole answer to this issue, this interoperability issue, but it could provide one small piece of the jigsaw. And then you could maybe get to the point where the metaverse is the successor to the internet that Neil Stevenson spoke about in Snow Crash. So we hope you found that useful. And maybe next time we could have this talk in VR. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Faye Harrison. I'm a senior associate in the data protection team. Um, Unfortunately, tonight I won't be joined by my co-author, Jamie Whitten, as he'd been struck down with COVID, so you've just got me to listen to for the next 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk to you about data transfers. Um, so there's a lot of noise about data transfers. We're always talking about it, and I think as privacy professionals, it's always something that's in our mind. Um, I think over the last year, there has been some more positive developments, perhaps, than we've previously seen. Um, the future is very unclear, and there's definitely some challenges on the horizon. Um, but I'm going to take a look at some of the positive developments um, and some of the less positive developments and kind of see where we land. So starting with the EU and the UK, and I apologise, I'm not going to speak about Brexit, um, but I appreciate that image is probably giving you that idea. Um, so starting with the EU, we've got the new EU SCCs that came out in the last year um, that lots of you will probably be familiar with. Um, these are great. They offer us lots more flexibility. Um, we've now got four modules, so we can address all kind of controller processor scenarios, and they seem to have been well received. There's been good uptake by businesses, um, so that's a positive. If you don't already know, we have until the 27th of December this year for any contracts that are on the old SCCs to be moved over to the new SCCs, so that's just something to bear in mind. Another positive development this year on the UK side of things has been the ICO toolkit. So we've now got the ICOs version of the standard contractual clauses. We've got the IDTA and also a UK addendum to the EU SCCs. Um, this has been a great development for co companies that have an EU and UK footprint um, because they can simplify their paperwork, have a single agreement with the EU SCCs and the UK addendum to cover all their transfers. So that's been really positive. Um, some of you may be aware of the Recital 7 issue with the EU SCCs. This is something that has been much discussed. Um, and essentially what it is, is Recital 7 of the EU SCCs states that they cannot be used um, where the company that you're transferring the data to, the company that's outside of the EU, is directly subject to the GDPR itself. Um, so it leaves us with a little bit of a gap. There's been a lot of talk about it. Um, the EU Commission has said that it's going to prepare another version, so possibly Module 4, sorry, 5, Module 5 of the SCCs, to cover this scenario. Um, but we don't know when that's coming. So at the moment, we've got kind of imperfect solutions for transfers of that nature. On the plus side, the UK toolkit does provide for these type of transfers. So at least when we're transferring just from the UK, we can cover that scenario. Um, but that's kind of really only the tip of the iceberg in terms of challenges for the SCCs. I suspect most of you will be aware of Max Schrems and his organisation, None of Your Business, or NOYB. They have made no less than 101 complaints against EU organisations that share data with Google and Facebook. Um, we've not had all of the decisions yet, but the ones that we've seen so far haven't been that encouraging. Um, we've had decisions from the Austrian and French data protection authorities um, who've essentially found Google Analytics to not be um, in line with GDPR data protection, sorry, GDPR data transfer rules, um, so we're in breach of those rules. And this has kind of caused mass panic, um, 
for companies that rely on Google Analytics and other Google products. Um, unfortunately, it's not necessarily limited in its application to Google. Um, certainly the CNIL, so the French authority, made some very general comments about sort of the lack of regulation in the US and the risk to French citizens. Um, so there are quite a lot of concerns about how far reaching these decisions are. The other thing that's quite concerning about these decisions is that they completely disregard the kind of risk-based considerations outlined in the EDPB recommendations on supplementary measures. Um, so for those of us who are kind of relying on those when we're filling out our DTIAs, that's a little bit of a worry. Um, obviously, these are not necessarily directly applicable, these decisions. Um, they related to the old SCCs, so we might be able to distinguish from that when we're using the new SCCs. And equally, they, they were made in certain jurisdictions. Um, so not directly applicable to the UK. Um, but I think in general, they've kind of eroded confidence in using the SCCs. And so people are a bit more cautious about using them and aren't sure about how to use them going forward. Um, in terms of other transfer solutions that we can use in the UK and EU, um, the UK has yet to make any independent adequacy decisions, um, but it is talking about becoming a national leader um, in facilitating cross-border data flows. Um, it's cited a number of countries that it is keen to make adequacy, adequacy decisions in respect of, so the US, India, Australia, which all sounds great in principle, but there is then this sort of question where it does make those decisions of how this will affect its own adequacy decision from the EU. Um, so that's all kind of a little bit in flux. UK BCRs is another interesting one for those of you who may have been involved. Um, you may be aware that the ICO um, had this process for companies that already had EU BCRs in place. Um, and the idea was that there would be a streamlined process for essentially grandfathering those EU BCRs across into UK BCRs. Um, from our experience, it hasn't been that streamlined. Um, we found there's been long wait times, the ICO are asking loads of questions, there's lots of backwards and forwards, sort of opening up of issues that were dealt with with the previous EU Data Protection Authority. Um, so we're not quite sure that it's really any different to applying for UK BCRs from scratch, other than perhaps you're a little bit further forward in the queue. Um, BCRs in general, um, there's a lot of wait times across the EU. Lots of the EU DPAs are quoting kind of three to five years um, to have a look at your application. So it's really not looking like a very attractive option at the moment, um, particularly because while you're waiting for that approval, you have to have an alternative transfer mechanism in place. Um, so not, not looking so positive on that side of things. I'm going to move on now across the pond to the US to talk about some of their developments. Um, most of you will probably be aware that in March of this year, we had agreement in principle on a new transatlantic data transfer agreement or Privacy Shield 2.0, as we're calling it. Um, both parties to the agreement are quite confident that it's gonna be able to withstand challenge from your privacy activists. Um, and it did take a, quite a long time to reach this agreement in principle. So commentators kind of feel that this demonstrates that it's likely to be quite successful. Um, we're thinking possibly December this year, we might get a final text, um, we'll wait and see. Um, but there is a need for some changes to US, current US legislation in order to give effect to some aspects of the agreement. So it's, it's all kind of a work in progress. The US is also taking steps to kind of demonstrate that it can uphold EU privacy standards. Um, it's working with other members of the OECD to develop an international pact on personal data access by surveillance agencies and law enforcement. Um, so this is to kind of underline what it's doing in respect of Privacy Shield and to help withstand any challenges. Um, so that's all looking quite positive. But then, of course, when you've got developments in the US, when it comes to privacy, we know that there are going to be challenges. Um, Max Schrems has been made it very clear already that he thinks that the new privacy shield will fail unless it's backed by a federal US law um, that essentially reflects US standards. Um, and he's actually written an open letter this week to EU and US officials setting out his preliminary observations, um, or one might say criticisms, um, of the new agreement and sort of questioning the future of adequacy agreements. 
And he's warned that Privacy Shield 2 might share the same fate as its predecessors, so Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield 1, um, unless there's some real changes to US law. And the US is not necessarily doing itself any favors um, in terms of demonstrating that it can provide adequate, pr adequate protection for privacy rights. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of the case of FBI and Fazaga, but essentially in this case, the FBI successfully relied on state secrets privilege in order to avoid having to explain its surveillance approach. Um, and this was in a closed court setting. So it doesn't look great in terms of what the US is trying to do and what it's trying to achieve. So overall, I think we can say that there are some glimmers of hope, that there is some light on the horizon. We've got new Privacy Shield coming, we've got new SCCs and the UK version of them. Um, obviously, we don't know if the new Privacy Shield will stand up to challenge. Maybe it will prove a better opponent than its predecessors. We've still got some issues with the SCCs and we're not quite sure when they'll become a bit more reliable. And as I said, BCRs aren't very accessible at the moment, but I think there's lots of steps in the right direction. And I think that all of the main players are kind of working towards a common goal of helping to facilitate data flows. Um, so we will see challenges, there will be issues, but I'm gonna remain cautiously optimistic that we're gonna see a better future for data transfers in the next couple of years. Um, and I'm sure we'll be here next year to update you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Alex Keenlyside. I'm a partner in the data protection team. I specialise in litigation and I'm going to talk uh, quite briefly about um, some positive news on the litigation front if you come at it as I do from the perspective of uh, defendants. So very clearly over the last few years there's been um, a surge in uh, low value data protection claims brought or at least threatened against all manner of um, data controllers. Um, but also at the other end of the spectrum, as I'm sure you're aware, there have been um, huge representative actions seeking billions in compensation um, for the class from uh, tech giants, Lloyd and Google being the most obvious example. But there have been these decisions over the last year um, which have really made it far more difficult for uh, claimants to bring data protection claims across the whole spectrum, from the low-level claims all the way through to those um, huge uh, collective actions. So I'm going to talk briefly about why, uh, why that's the case and speculate a little as to uh, what might happen next. So, am I going to get this right? No. There we go. We're going to talk about low value claims first. That's a pile of coppers, or it should be. Um, what am I talking about when I talk about low value claims? So these are the, you know, the, 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 the cases where somebody sent an email to the wrong person, or perhaps somebody has uncovered some tiny flaw in your compliance, and they, they assert some great level of distress as a consequence and they, they threaten to sue you, um, including under data protection, and they, they want to recover you know, a few hundred quid or possibly uh, something in the low thousands. And these claims are incredibly frustrating. Um, they're often utterly trivial or contrived, but they're disproportionately costly to defend. And the consequence of that is that for a long time, everybody settled. They just couldn't, it was never deemed worth it to, to fight these threatened claims. Over the last, well, I suppose it must have been happening over the last couple of years, and, and they've reached course over the last 12 months or so, clearly some defendants had had enough of this um, state of play, and they had fought, they had defended uh, on principal grounds these, these terribly trivial claims. And as a consequence of they, them fighting those claims, we now have a body of decisions which, as I say, are making life a lot harder for, for claimants in the, to bring these, um, these low-level DP claims. So the main reason is that they're now much, uh, well, much less financially viable for claimants and, for, importantly, for claimant solicitors' firms. So there are two reasons for that. The first is that the courts have decided that these low-level DP claims, if they're allowed to proceed at all, 
should proceed in the county court rather than in the high court. And within the county court, they should proceed in something called the small claims track. I don't want to bore you with the um, detail of what the small claims track means, but the important point is that you can't recover costs in the same way as a successful claimant in the small claims track as you might be able to in other courts. So the standard position, if you are successful in litigation, is that you'll recover at least two thirds of your costs. In the small claims track, that simply doesn't apply. And uh, the, you, you are limited to a very low level in terms of what you can recover from, the side, from, the, from your opponent, even if you defeat them. Um, secondly, uh, claimants often bring claims in misuse of private information alongside their, their claims in data protection. But in an important, a very short but important decision of the High Court in Warren and DSG, the judge ruled that in circumstances like where uh, a claim follows on from a cyber attack, it, ca it can't properly be said that the defendant, i.e. the controller, um, has actually misused the data in question. The, the controller in, in, in the cyber case, scenario, cyber attack scenario, has, has plainly not misused the, the data. They are themselves the victim of, a, a, of an attack and the claimant is trying to um, pin liability uh, for that on them. And the court has said in a misuse of private information context, that is simply wrong. And there are some important funding consequences of that, which I won't go into in any detail, but in short, it means that an ATE premium won't be recoverable for claimants, uh, an after the event insurance premium won't be recoverable uh, for claimants um, in, in, if they bring a, a data protection claim. So summing up those, those two points, claimants are potentially on the hook for their own costs, even if they win, and they're on the hook for the other side's potentially on the, hook, on the hook for the other side's costs if they lose, if they can't get um, ATE insurance. So as I say, low value claims are um, much, uh, uh, much harder to bring now from a financial perspective for, for, for claimants. You know? um, moving to the other end of the spectrum, so collective actions. So this is, um, your, your, your person at the top there is, is the representative, that's why, that's why I chose this slide. Um, so maybe let's call him Mr. Lloyd. Um, so the Lloyd and Google case, which I won't go into in any detail because I'm sure you will know a great deal about it, but there was, of course, an incredibly important decision of the Supreme Court in that case, um, which uh, overturned the decision of the Court of Appeal in, a, in an extremely helpful way for all controllers. But just as way, by way of reminder, this was a representative action brought by Mr. Lloyd against Google in relation to Google's collection and use of the browser-generated information of about 4 million iPhone users. W what is a representative action? Well, it's a, it is a uh, route by which um, a collective action can be brought um, in the courts. It's where one person brings a claim on behalf of a class of individuals. Very importantly, it only works procedurally if all the members of the class have the same interest in the claim. And I'll come back to that. So as I say, the Supreme Court overturned the Court of Appeals decision, in, and, and most, most notably it did so in, the, in, in relation to loss of control. So the Court of Appeal had said it was available to a claimant in a data protection action to recover damages um, for loss of control of their personal data. So the Supreme Court said, no, that's not right. And this decision is probably, more than anything else, has, has had a huge impact on um, the number of data protection claims now being issued, it means effectively that a claimant wishing to bring a claim in data protection has to prove that they have suffered financial loss or distress as a consequence of the alleged breach. But then the Supreme Court went on to say that even if loss of control damages were available, damage, whether for loss of control or distress, needs to be assessed on an individualised basis. So the represented class can't be said to have the same interest. So in plain English, what do I mean? I mean you can't just assume that everyone who's been affected by an alleged breach has been affected in the same way. The degree of distress um, will, will vary from one individual to another. And this makes representative actions in this space extremely challenging. And it's, um, that's demonstrated by the fact that several representative actions which have been on hold effectively pending the Lloyd decision have since been abandoned. So uh, where next? So the result of everything I've talked about, so the, 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 these um, decisions are in relation to the low-level claims, but also Lloyd, is that there's been a marked drop-off in the number of data protection claims being issued. So 
in the last week of April in 2021, there were 33 data protection claims issued in the High Court. In the same week this year, there were precisely none. So there is very obviously something happening here, and from a defendant perspective, it's, it's, it's good news. That said, um, I'm not sure we've reached the end of the road. I think um, various things are likely to happen. Indeed, you know, in the short term, we're seeing claimants already pivot towards um, claims and misuse of private information at both ends of the spectrum, at the low level and at the, 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 cl the group action level, because loss of control damages are available in misuse of private information. I think we're also going to see renewed calls for the government to legislate and to put collective actions in this area on a stronger footing, even though uh, following consultation last year they decided not to do so. I do think there'll be, well, we were, we're in fact already seeing increasing lobbying um, for, for the government to revisit that. And, you know, with every serious and well-publicised um, breach that takes place, because inevitably there will be more, that provides impetus for the claimant lawyers and for the funders who are pushing for change. Those stakeholders are far too involved in this now um, to, to, to simply give up, and we anticipate they'll, they're going to seek novel ways to pursue these kinds of claims. So, hard as it is, when I, when I put my neutral hat on, it does seem to me quite likely that the government or the courts, or both, are going to have to grapple further with this issue. If there's a, a perception, a sense, that, that there's now a barrier in place preventing individuals from obtaining relief where they have a meritorious claim, um, then something obviously will have to be done about that. So certainly some positive developments from a defendant perspective. Um, we almost certainly what well, we are seeing far fewer data protection claims. I think that will continue in the short to medium term. Longer term, I think that's probably not sustainable because I think the government or the courts will um, be forced to, uh, to intervene. Um, I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, I'm Hannah Crowther, I'm a senior associate in the data protection team. I am your last talk for today, which I'm sure you'll be all delighted about because there's booze next door. Um, and I am going to be talking about research. Um, so this is hopefully, I think probably a lot of you will recognise her. This is Professor Sarah Gilbert, pictured here with the Barbie doll, which was launched for her last August um, in recognition of her work in developing the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. Um, and I think, I mean, certainly the last few years have made us all sit up and listen and think, goodness me, isn't research absolutely fabulous? Um, and, you know, we've really obviously seen that in medical research, but every day we are seeing examples of the enormous benefit of research and also just the really interesting things that it reveals to us about the impact of climate change, about how we've all been impacted by being locked up for two years. Um, and obviously in the world of technology, it is enabling enormous advances and very exciting things so that all the stuff that Dan and Christopher um, were talking about can actually happen. All of that is pinned on personal data, pretty much. Very, very hard to do research without personal data. And luckily, the GDPR and UK, the UK Data Protection Act recognises that and contains lots of provisions which say that you can do certain things and that certain rules don't apply when you're conducting research. But those provisions can be very, very tricky to interpret and they are all over the GDPR and the DPA and it is quite confusing. And that is why, in our experience, certainly, some of the, often the people in the scientific research community are some of the most frustrated with the GDPR. They're the ones with the most rage, the most GDPR rage, shall we call it. Um, <coughs> now, the first, one of the, the biggest questions for some of them, uh, if you're looking at, oh, well, you, you tell me we've got all these great provisions in the GDPR, is do I get to rely on them? What actually is research? It's a very, very difficult thing to define, particularly in technology, where a lot of people are grappling with the, with the question of that real grey area between research and technological development and product improvement and product development, and at what point have I moved from sort of proper research into just making my product better so I can make money? And at what point is that research? So it's not research is not defined in the GDPR. Um, the GDPR says that it must be defined broadly 
um, and it does refer to technological development, very useful, um, and it does refer to paid for research. So we know that you know, there is commercial, there can be a commercial lens to it, but it's not currently defined in the law. It may, however, be defined in the law. Um, Mark mentioned that uh, in the, the Queen's speech, they announced the data reform bill. Nobody knows yet, well, presumably there's some civil servants out there, but none of us know yet what's going to be in the data reform bill. But one of the suggestions from the consultation back last year was that it might include a statutory definition of research. Um, I don't envy the drafters on that one, but that's their problem, not mine. The ICO has also tried to tackle this question, what is research? Um, they have put out draft guidance, um, not yet in final form. And the way that they've approached this is to say, we don't think we can define it either, and we know the GDPR wants it to be defined really broadly. So instead, we're putting out a list of criteria. And the more criteria you meet, the more likely it is it will be research. And some of their criteria include, is there a hypothesis? Have you got peer review? Are you publishing your findings? Have you got an ethics committee involved? And the more of those criteria you tick, the more likely it is you'll be doing research. But you don't have to meet any of them. It's not the law. And so there would be other ways of demonstrating we still think this is research, even if we don't, but it's a good indicative criteria. I personally quite like that approach. Um, so we'll see what happens, whether the new law railroads through that, but um, conversation for another day. So I think all of those things may help, though, with this very, very difficult question. Now, what are the other reasons why we decided to talk about research today? Um, there are two reasons. Uh, the first one is that um, a large part, potentially, of the data reform bill will be talking about scientific research and making it easier. Now, I've put this, we don't, as I say, we don't know what's in the bill, but the explanatory notes that came with this Queen's speech said that it was gonna do this. It was gonna be simplifying the rules around research to cement the UK's position as a science and technology superpower. So that all sounds very exciting. Um, so I think it's all gonna be great and we're all gonna be superstars. <coughs> we don't know the substance. As I said, some of the ideas from the consultation include having um, a new lawful basis for processing just for research. So at the moment you would probably say, it's research, legitimate interest, great, but you could get your own special legal basis just for you. Um, the idea that you should be allowed to get data subjects to give a general consent to unspecified research, because a lot of researchers find that's a real problem. GDPR says consent has to be specific, but I've collected this data, maybe I want to use it for a number of purposes. Maybe I haven't worked out what I want to use it for. Maybe I know that that will iterate and evolve throughout my, pro throughout my research product project. So that might be one of the ideas that they include under the new law. Another idea that was suggested in the consultation was an exemption from the notice obligation where it would be impossible or prove disproportionate effort, which the geeks of you will recognize from Article 14 of the GDPR. And so they've just, they could borrow that across and say, that will also apply if you're using data for research so that maybe you don't have to go back and tell people from years ago or from a different study or from you know, a, a different context whether about the research you, that you're about to conduct. And then they've also suggested um, maybe using, including some more provisions specifically on the secondary use of data for research purposes. So we don't know what it's going to be yet, but I think it does seem likely that a very large proportion of the data reform bill will concern research. The second reason we thought it was worth talking about was the new ICO draft guidance. Now, I do feel a little bit bad for the ICO on this front because they have just put out this draft guidance. Presumably we're gonna get final guidance and we're also getting a whole new law, which is presumably gonna make the guidance totally wrong. But anyway, that is their problem and not mine, so that's fine. But I do feel a bit sad for whoever put all the effort in. Um, I think the draft guidance is really quite useful because um, 
as I said, the provisions around scientific and historical research in the GDPR and the DPA, they're scattered here and there like pixie dust. They are everywhere. And it's actually quite useful that the ICO has taken the time to put them all into one sort of document so you can read through and you won't be thinking, oh my God, I missed section 73 of schedule 14, which also mentions it. So I think the guidance is really useful in that sense. Um, yeah, we'll wait to see the finalized version. Um, so those were the two reasons why I thought it was particularly worth talking about. The only last thing that I wanted to mention before I go was the absolutely brilliantly named new European Data Health Space Regulation, um, which is nothing to do with space, sadly, but I think is instead a cool buzzword where it's about the data space. Um, and that uh, was put out by the Commission as a proposal in March. And um, one of the things that that does, amongst other really quite technical, and I'm going to go out and say it, unbelievably dull uh, rules on the use of electronic health records. Um, it also seeks to provide a lawful basis for processing special category data for research purposes under Article 9, um, which a lot of people really struggled with because it has to have a basis in European or member state law and nobody really knows what that means. And they've said, yep, we're going to put it in this law. We're going to put it in the space law. Um, so, yeah, that, if you have a European presence, is, I think, quite good news. Uh, thank you very much. Anyway, look, it just remains uh, for me to thank you all for, for coming. It really has been lovely to see you. Uh, thank you to everybody on the team in particular. Um, for, for helping get the publication together. A massive thanks to our wonderful uh, marketing and business development team for laying on the event, and, um, and in particular for putting this amazing publication together. We really appreciate it, so thank you. Uh, so if you could all just join me uh, in thanking everybody in the usual way, that'd be great. <laughs> And what would be even better is if you could all join me next door for a glass of wine. So thank you very much. <laughs>